Eating meat has been part of human history and culture for as long as anybody can remember. But in recent years, there's been growing con controversy around this practice. The debate on meat consumption centers around animal welfare and the environmental impact of meat production and the health implications caused by eating meat. However, despite these concerns, many of us continue to eat meat and defend our right to eat. The fight for the right to eat meat has become a controversial subject with strong opinions both for and against the eating of the consumption of me. It's important to investigate, understand the arguments and perspectives from both sides, which is what we're going to do in this week's podcast. We're going to review the book, The Big Fat Surprise. We're going to discuss various diets, but namely focus on the blue zones where the greatest number of people live to 100 years old. And then we're going to discuss government's role in health and how government's decisions today affect the health of the nation tomorrow. So without further ado, let's begin with The Big Fat Surprise. The Big Fat Surprise by Nina Techholtz is a thought-provoking and mental meticulously researched book that challenges the conventional wisdom surrounding dietary fat and its impact on our health. The book presents a compelling argument that our current understanding of the role of fat in our diet is flawed and that much of the advice we receive about reducing fat in our diet has been misguided and potentially harmful. The book traces the history of dietary fat recommendations from the 20th century when it was considered an essential part of our diet to the low fat craze of the 1980s and 90s which saw fat vilified as the culprit of heart disease and various other health problems. The book provides a detailed analysis of the scientific studies compiled over the decade, detailed analysis of the study that informed these recommendations and exposes the flaws and biases that led to the demonization of fat. One of the most compelling aspects of the book is the exploration of the impact of the low fat diet on our health. She argues that the reduction of fat in our diets that has been recommended for decades may have actually contributed to the rise in obesity, diabetes and other health problem that we are seeing today. The book also presents evidence that a diet based on healthy fats may actually be more beneficial than the low fat diet. Overall, Big Fat Surprise is a well-written and engaging book that challenges the status quo and encourages readers to rethink their own assumptions on dietary fat. While some of the concepts might be challenging to understand if you don't have a background in nutritional medicine, yet Nina does an excellent job in making the material accessible and engaging. Anyone who is interested in improving their health through diet should read this book as it provides valuable insights into the roles of fat in our diet and its impact on our health. Some of the top myths that were debunked while reading this book were saturated fat causes heart disease. In the book, Nina argues that there is no evidence to support the idea that saturated fat is a major cause of heart disease. She points out several studies that have failed to link saturated fat intake and heart disease and argues that other factors such as inflammation may play more a more important role in the development of heart disease. The second myth is low fat diets are healthy. In the book, they argue that the low fat diet craze of the 1980s and the 1990s may have actually contributed to the rise in obesity, diabetes, and other health problems that we are seeing in today's society. She suggests that a diet that is high in fats from nuts, seeds, and avocados may actually be more beneficial to our health than the low fat diet. Myth three, vegetable oils are healthier than animal fats. The idea that vegetable oils are healthier than animal fats is based on flawed science. She points she points out studies that have proven that high levels of omega-6 fatty acids found in vegetable oils may actually lead to the increase in inflammation and contribute to a whole range of health problems. Cholesterol, cholesterol is bad for us. The book argues that the idea that cholesterol is bad for us is based on outdated science. She points out to studies that suggest that cholesterol may not be a major cause to heart disease as it was once thought and argues that dietary cholesterol may actually be beneficial to our health. The only way to lose weight weight is to eat a low fat diet. The book turns this idea completely around as, as it highlights that you do not lose weight from a low fat diet. She suggests that a diet high in healthy fats combined with the reduction of carbohydrates may actually be more effective to weight loss than the low fat diet. When reading this book, it, it opens your eyes to how science can be manipulated to give certain findings that are more beneficial to the industries that are paying for the science. Dairy industry, vegan food industry, vegetable oil industries. And one of the most troubling find is scientific research and the phenomenon of researchers skewing the data to get their desired outcome. The first way they achieve this is by cherry picking the data where researchers selectively report data that supports their hypothesis while 
while ignoring the data that contradicts it. Then there's p-hack, which is a term where researchers manipulate the statistical analysis in order to achieve significant results. For example, they may try multiple tests, and when they find a test that gives them the result they're after, that's the test they use, and ignore the other five or six tests that didn't give them the correct data. And then there's the term harking. Harking is when the researcher creates their own hypothesis prior to their research, and then uses research and data to prove their hypothesis, focusing only on information that proves their point of view. And then lastly, in order to get your medical journals published, you have to go through what is called publication bias. And depending on which publication you want to get published, your data has to align with the fundamental ethos of that publication, or it won't get published, which means it won't get peer reviewed, which means that data and that science will not get known by the outside world. And this is very dangerous. And this is what's caused this trouble that we're in now, where nobody actually knows what's right and what's wrong, because there are so many conflicting reports, all with skewed data, telling you what they want you to know. And when we think about health, if anything from reading this book is told, can't believe everything you read all the time. And I think it's important that everything we do should be with an open mind. I happen to be particularly focused on my health and for reasons that are personal to me, I really want to live a, as long and as healthy as I possibly can. And in order to do that, I've, I've researched many talks. And when I was researching last year on how to live longer, I came across Dan Buettner's um, National Geographic um, special on the Blue Zone, which are the five countries around the world where they have more centenarians per capita than everywhere in the world. And when I started reading the data on these different people, it became very clear that in the wrong hands, the data can be skewed to push a non-meat based diet as the root cause to living a long and healthy life. And for those of you who don't know the Blue Zones, the Blue Zones are specific regions around the world like Sardinia in Italy, Okinawa in Japan, Lima, uh, Loma Linda in California, Nicoya, Costa Rica, and Ikara, Greece. And these regions have the highest capita of centenarians in anywhere in, in, in any other place in the world. And there are several factors that contribute to the longevity of these people. One most significant factor is they eat a high plant-based diet of mostly whole foods, which is rich in fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. These diets are low in processed sugars and have moderate to little amounts of animal. In addition, the people in the blue zones eat smaller portions and practice intermittent fasting, which has been linked to improve health and longevity. Another key factor in the, longe in the longevity of the blue zones is social connected. The people in these regions tend to have strong social networks and close family ties. They often belong to faith-based communities and other groups that provide a sense of purpose and belong. Regular physical activity is the hallmark of the blue zone of the people that live in the blue zone. These people engage in natural physical activity, gardening, walking, manual labor, rather than structured exercise routine. And finally, stress reduction. People that live in the blue zone tend to have very low stress levels, and a lot of them practice relaxation techniques such as meditation or even prayer. So I think it's important to identify that overall health is created by an interwoven lifestyle of healthy eating, exercise, community, and having a purpose and belonging in order to contribute to a longer, healthier life. Now, predominantly, the people from the blue zones, they consume a wide variety of vegetables. Anything that they can grow in season, they consume fruits, whole grains, legumes being their main source of protein. They eat beans, lentils, peas on a regular basis, which are all high in protein, fiber, and important nutrients. They eat nuts and seeds, and then some of them consume fish, some of them consume dairy, and some of them consume animal products on a reduced amount, but on a regular basis. However, overall, their nutrients is acquired from a plant-based diet that are minimally minimally processed and high in fiber, vitamins, and minerals. And they also tend to eat smaller portions whilst practicing intermittent fasting. So I think it's clear that the people in the blue zones live longer, not just because of the diet they eat, but because of their lifestyle. And this is the point I want to make is diet is so important, but it's not the only important factor in being healthy. You know, the people of the blue zones eat very rare, eat whole foods, nothing processed, everything made from scratch. And, and the countries that do consume meat consume very little amounts of, but it's all natural meat. There's no processed meat in. So I think it's safe to say that meat can be part of a healthy diet. We've got the scientific proof from the big fat surprise, and we've got the, the data on these lo the longevity of the people of the blue zone. Now, if you can combine the two, there is no reason why meat can't form a part of a healthy lifestyle. And as long as we're practicing the important lifestyle activities like physical activity, you know, walking, gardening, having a manual job, you know, full of natural movement, which will improve our cardiovascular health and lower our rates of chronic disease just by being more active. They have the social connectedness. You know,
know, the people in the blue zones have huge community and family ties, which in our busy lives, we've sort of neg neglected. We focus on our, our, our jobs and our immediate insular family, like our children. We have very little time to build communities and social lives around our lives, which is an important aspect as to why more people are getting depressed. Again, we spend a huge amount of our time working and a lot of us work in high stress jobs, which cause increased amount of inflammation in our body, which increases our risk of chronic disease. And of course, there's always genetics. While lifestyle plays a significant role in, the longe in our longevity of life, there is also a genetic component that affects our lives and our body's prejudices towards illness and sick. But overall, a combination of a healthy lifestyle and habit, social connectedness and reduced stress contribute to our longevity. And by working all these factors into our life will change. It. And I think it's important again to talk about diet. I mean, anybody who's lived on this planet for any amount of years has battled with their weight at one point in their life. And some people are blessed where they don't put on weight and some people are blessed where they do put on. But ultimately, our diet is the most important way we can control our weight. But at the same time, we have to be aware that diet is not the only factor and that there are many other factors that come, that come into play when, when we look at our body. We have to take our genetics into account and we have to take our lifestyle. If we are highly stressed, we're going to find it very difficult to stick to a good diet or lifestyle. If we have no time, we're going to find it very difficult to prepare all our food from scratch and we're going to, it's going to lead us to convenience shopping or convenience eating. And none of these trends lead towards positive health. I think it's important to think about how our health is affected by the choices we make. And it's very hard to make informed choices when we're not doing the research. And what we also have to take into account is, so I think it's both lifestyle and diet are important to maintaining good health as they are often interrelated. However, focusing on lifestyle can be more beneficial than solely focusing on our diet for several reasons. Firstly, lifestyle factors things like physical activity, stress management, and adequate sleep. These are all important for overall health and well-being. These factors can can influence a person's risk for chronic disease, such as heart disease, diabetes, cancer, as well as mental health conditions like anxiety and depression. While diet is important for providing the body with essential nutrients, it's not the only factor that contributes to good health. Secondly, lifestyle change may be easier to maintain than strict dietary restriction. Many diets are difficult to sustain over the long term, and they can often lead to feelings of deprivation and guilt. In contrast, lifestyle change, such as incorporating more physical exercise into our daily routine, practicing stress reduction techniques like meditation and praying, and getting enough sleep can be easier to integrate into our daily lives and lead to substantial improvements in our health. Lastly, lifestyle changes can have positive ripple effects on other areas of our personal life. For example, regular physical activity can boost our mood and our energy level, which may lead to an increase in productivity and motivation to work on personal relationships. While diet is an important as focusing on lifestyle factors such such as physical activity, stress management, and adequate sleep can have a more comprehensive impact overall on our health and our well-being. And we've seen this in the Blue Zone. The Blue Zone diet is not just a diet. The Blue Zone lifestyle is what we need to be looking for. And we need to be creating that in our busy lives. And that is what we should be working toward. And also education is truly important. If people aren't educating themselves or if people haven't been educated into what's right and what's wrong, they tend to make the same wrong decisions over and over again. So we have to change how we educate the people around us, which brings me to my last point of government interfering in how we eat. And although governments generally aim to promote public health and well-being, in some cases they may seek to regulate or influence people's diets for this purpose. However, many people believe that government should not interfere in our diet, and there are several reasons for this. Firstly, people have the right to choose what they eat. Dietary choices is a matter of personal preference, cultural tradition, and individual's health, and governments should not dictate what people can and can cannot consume. Mandating dietary restriction can also be seen as a violation of one's personal freedom. Secondly, it's not always clear what constitutes a healthy diet. Nutritional science is a complex and ever-changing field, and there is often debate amongst experts about the best dietary guidelines. And we've seen how the government's interference in the dietary guidelines has caused a massive issue. If we just look at America, and we look at the increased obesity and heart disease from the 1980s and 1990s, when government mandated the low low fat high carbohydrate because of bad science and this is where we have to be very careful where government should not be pushing unknown diet.
data or even known data because science changes over time. So governments don't always have the most accurate up-to-date information to base their recommendations. And so their interference in people's diets may lead to an increase in health issues. So their interference in people's diets may not necessarily lead to a better health. Dietary choices are if often influenced by factors such as socioeconomic status, culture, and access to healthy food options. Governments can work to address these underlying issues by promoting education and access to healthy food options rather than mandating what people can and cannot. So people have the right to make their own dietary choices. Governments should focus on promoting education and access to the data so people can make their own informed decisions rather than dictating what people's diets should be. And I'm going to close today's podcast off with this thought. What we have to remember is there is always a lot of attention on areas where there's a lot of money. Now, you have the vegan, vegetarian diet doctors all over the internet. And these guys are highly paid individuals. They're paid by the various industries that have gotten behind, that have gotten behind the the reduction or removal of animal products from our diets. Animal rights activists, the environmental activists, and then the people that believe that plant diet is the only way forward. And there is no scientific data correlating between these, these these two factions. There is no data that proves categorically that meat causes any unhealthy side effects. There is concern that, you know, animal products are harder on the environment than non-animal products. And that is a conversation for another time. But I think it's really important to remember where there's a lot of focus, there's generally a lot of money. And money tends to manipulate and change the scenario. And vegan food is highly processed. Therefore, there is potential for industries to make a lot of money. So I think it's very important that people realize that there is no smoke without fire and there is a lot of bad fat and bad science out there and there's a lot of people sponsored by these industries so next time you sit down and you decide you want to be healthier you want to lose a bit of weight start reading and I suggest this week's book of the week big fat surprise and take it from there and remember a diet is just a small step and you might find that you have to do several eight different types of diets till you find what works well for you when you want to lose weight there's going to have to be a deficit somewhere in order for your body to switch over to burn fat but what you have to remember is you will not burn fat if your body is producing a huge amount of insulin. So the best secret and the best tool in my arsenal, what I use, is intermittent fasting. Because provided you have a 16-hour fasting window, your insulin is dropped right down. Your body is burning fat. If you're eating cleanly with a good fasting period in between, you will naturally lose. You do not have to cut things out your diet. You just have to eat as healthy and as unprocessed as possible. And like everything I do on the Clive Bird experiment, is is I'm continuously trying to improve my life and the people around me. So I make these videos not to tell you what to do. I make these videos to give you an idea that there are a million options out. All you have to do, get on your computer and look at stuff, read a few documents and then try and see what works. Everybody is different. Every single one of us have a different genetic makeup. Every single one of us, our bodies work differently. Some people work really well on a low fat, high carb. Some people really work well on a high fat, low carb. But the secret is to have a a balanced life and lifestyle.